Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng explain class struggle to British people. Death agony of Brexit catastrophe. Six years into the Brexit disaster, the malevolent anti-democratic forces who did so much to facilitate the success of the vote to leave the EU in June 2016 are finally where they always wanted to be, running the government, and able to implement their four prevailing obsessions, enriching the already rich at everyone else's expense, shrinking the state, or preferably entirely obliterating the state provision of any services whatsoever, using the UK's departure from the EU as an opportunity to scrap all the inconvenient rights that have protected the British people and the environment from grotesque exploitation, and denying the existence of catastrophic climate change to further enrich the oil and gas companies that are driving the planet to extinction. These anti-democratic forces, largely clustered in a handful of buildings in Tufton Street in Westminster, just a stone's throw from Parliament, include the Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, the Taxpayers' Alliance, the Center for Policy Studies and the Adam Smith Institute, all far-right, libertarian, think tanks representing the extreme fringe of neoliberalism, as George Monbiot explained in an article for The Guardian on Friday. Also related, though located 400 yards to the north, is Policy Exchange, another right-wing think tank, and Tufton Street was also initially home to the Vote Leave campaign, which was registered there, as well as Leave Means Leave, which campaigned for a hard Brexit after the EU referendum. It is also currently home to the Global Warming Policy Foundation, DWPW. This latter group has been described by climate researchers and environmental groups as the UK's most prominent source of climate denialism, as was explained in an Open Democracy article in May, when, two MPs, three Lords members and more than 70 scientists, writers, and campaign groups, sent a letter to the Charity Commission complaining that the GWPF was not a charity but a fossil fuel lobby group, after evidence emerged establishing that it had received donations from a foundation with millions of dollars worth of shares in oil, gas and coal companies, despite claiming it would not take cash from anyone with a fossil fuel interest. The funding of all of these organizations, many, absurdly, run, like GWPF, as charities, is highly opaque, as the investigative organization Transparify has explained, although, as with the example provided by GWPF, it's clear that some funding comes from the fossil fuel industry, as well as from far-right U.S. foundations committed to climate change denial. In his article, George Monbiot pointed out how Truss has surrounded herself with representatives of these think tanks, and further information can be found in Liz Truss, the Tufton Street candidate, an article by Sam Bright in Byline Times in January this year. As Monbiot explained, Truss's senior special advisor, Ruth Porter, was the communications director of the IEA, and then became the head of economic and social policy at Policy Exchange. Her chief economic advisor is Matthew Sinclair, who was formerly the chief executive of the Taxpayers' Alliance. Her interim press secretary, Alex Wilde, was the research director for the Taxpayers' Alliance. Her health advisor, Caroline Elsom, was a senior researcher at the Center for Policy Studies, and her political secretary, Sophie Jarvis, was the head of government affairs at the Adam Smith Institute. According to Mark Littlewood, the current head of the IEA, prior to her victory in the Tory leadership contest, Liz Truss had spoken at more IEA events than any other politician over the past 12 years, and now that she has become prime minister, and has surrounded herself with staff from the Tufton Street think tanks, their obsessions are official government policy, even though the government in question has no mandate for its extreme right-wing agenda. Truss was elected by just 81,326 members of the Conservative Party, and yet, rather than seeking approval for her plans via a general election, she has, instead, chosen to unleash a blitz of new and almost unimaginably damaging and inappropriate policies, all bearing the hallmarks of her subservience to the Tufton Street ideology. The energy price cap and the refusal to impose a windfall tax on energy companies, in the few hours of parliamentary activity undertaken by the new government before the death of Queen Elizabeth II was announced, derailing Parliament for the next 10 days, Truss didn't immediately launch the kind of agenda that the think tanks hoped for. Instead, it had to announce the introduction of energy price caps to stem rising energy costs that would plunge two-thirds of the country into abject and unprecedented poverty. If the situation hadn't been catastrophic, she definitely would have decided to do nothing. This means that the average household will pay around £2,500 a year, an infinitely increasing cost that consumers would otherwise have had, could be up to £5,000 a year in 2023, is not. Truss later capped the company's energy costs, but initially she was only six months. This leaves many companies with little assurance of future viability. No one knows exactly how much this intervention will cost, but expert estimates suggest it will cost at least £100 billion and possibly more. 